Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering, and this is module 13 in my computer networks lecture series, where I talk about our first Mac algorithm, which is an algorithm known as the Aloha protocol. So Aloha is arguably the simplest of all Mac algorithms, and it was developed back in the 70s by some researchers at the University of Hawaii, originally to network the different buildings of the University of Hawaii campus together using a, uh, a wireless packet radio system, an early wireless packet radio system. And it's a very straightforward protocol. Basically, it's decentralized, so every node gets to decide for itself when it wants to transmit. It's dynamic access the channel is not reserved in any way and basically the way the algorithm works is if you've got a packet of data to transmit you just send it you don't listen to the channel you don't think about the other nodes if you've got something to, to say you just send it and if you know two nodes on the shared network happen to be transmitting at the same time and the packets interfere with each other chances are both packets will fail their crc check and if that happens, both of the transmitting nodes just wait a random time and then they, they retransmit again. And, uh, you know, like with all Mac, or with most Mac algorithms anyways, we can sort of um, create an analogy to a conversation or how people kind of uh, conduct themselves when having a conversation. And, and I think of the Aloha algorithm as kind of like the way a, a toddler or a very young child talks. So I know when my son was very small and he was just learning to talk, as soon as something came into his head, he would just blurt it out. And, you know, it didn't matter if somebody else was talking, you know, he just, he, if he had something to say, he just said it. And, and that's a lot like what, a, that's a lot how, um, or that's a lot like Aloha, basically. So, this notion of you know waiting a random time to retransmit is something called a back off algorithm so if two nodes sort of access the channel and then they collide you know waiting a random period of time is something that's known as back off and you know if two nodes transmit at the same time and then they both wait a random time for their retransmission, chances are when they retransmit, they're not going to collide because those two random wait times will be different. But there is still a possibility that a second um, collision might occur. So what I want to do now is derive an expression for the performance of the Aloha protocol. And similar to ARQ, our performance metric is essentially going to be the effective throughput offered by the algorithm. So again, network design, it all basically boils down to data rate, throughput, and we want to see what kind of throughput Aloha can offer the users who are connected to the shared channel. And one of the sort of fundamental mechanisms that reduce the throughput of a Mac algorithm, particularly the dynamic channel access ones, is this notion of packet collisions. So if people are just, or if nodes are just accessing the channel when they need to access it, there is a probability that two nodes will transmit at the same time. When that happens, those transmissions interfere with each other, the bits in both frames get corrupted. Typically both frames will fail their CRC check and those frames will have to be retransmitted. That retransmission, similar to like a retransmission in an ARQ scheme, a retransmission of an existing frame sort of steals channel bandwidth, wastes channel bandwidth if you like, and lowers the effective throughput experienced by the user. And so central to the analysis of Aloha performance is this notion of a vulnerable period. And so we're going to define the duration of our transmitted frame, TF, as the number of bits in the frame, NF, divided by the raw throughput of our channel. And the vulnerable period is basically the 
duration of time or the, the time window around our transmitted frame that we can potentially experience interference from another user. And so in this um, picture, let's assume that the packet that I'm circling in green represents our desired packet. So we're, that we're taking the perspective of you know, us as a single user in the shared channel, we've transmitted this green packet and we want that packet to arrive successfully. We, the packet will not arrive if another user of the shared channel decides to transmit in such a way that it interferes with our transmitted packet. And, you know, again, Aloha, everybody can just choose to transmit whenever they want. And so this red square um, represents the interfering packet or not red square, red, re red rectangle. And the vulnerable, vulnerable period is basically the time window during which a second packet transmission will interfere with our desired packet. So obviously if, you know, the interfering packet lines up exactly with um, our transmitted packet, we're going to interfere. However, it's a little bit worse than that. Even if the transmitted packet occurs sort of halfway or starts halfway through our desired frame, it's still going to interfere. Because remember the way error detection works is um, if any bit is bad in our frame, we're going to experience or we're going to fail our CRC check. And so the first half of our frame might arrive successfully, but in this case, the second half of our frame would be corrupted and we would fail our CRC check. Even if we have the bad luck for this interfering packet to line up just with the very final bit in our desired frame. So even if we overlap by just one bit, if that bit is corrupted, it still causes us to fail our CRC check. So basically this interfering frame can start anywhere during our desired packet and we would fail our CRC. However, it's a little bit worse than that because of course the interfering packet could start before our desired packet transmission and we would still fail our CRC. So in this particular case, the interfering packet started before we decided to send and in this case, the first half of our desired packet would be corrupted. The second half would probably be okay, but we would still fail our CRC. Even to the point again, where, you know, we just happen to overlap with the very last bit in um, the interfering packet, we would fail our CRC. And so basically the vulnerable period is anywhere from our transmission time t naught to t naught plus the duration of our frame to t naught minus the duration of our frame. And in this case, I, I should have said before, we're making the assumption that all packets, you know, desired packets and interfering packets are the same length. So all packets are length tf. And so if an interfering transmission occurs anywhere from T naught minus TF to T naught plus TF, it's going to collide with our desired packet and we're going to lose our frame and have to retransmit. So, because, so fundamental to the notion of evaluating the throughput of the Aloha algorithm is the need to characterize the likelihood of these collisions happening. So if a collision happens, our throughput automatically goes down. And because nodes can basically transmit packets whenever we, whenever they want, we model packet transmission as a random process. And so we're going to, again, you're going to see the use of probability theory here in our analysis. And essentially what we're going to be doing in the next few slides is trying to figure out the probability of a collision. And the probability of a collision is basically the probability that a transmission of an one or more interfering packets occurs during the vulnerable period. 
And so in order for our packet to get through, we need to have no other transmissions from T naught minus TF to T naught plus TF. Now, as you can imagine, this probability of collision is going to depend a lot on how busy the channel is. So if there's a lot of nodes with a lot of things to transmit, you know, we're going to see a lot of packets and the probability of collision is going to go up. And so fundamental to calculating this probability is going to be the, the concept of load. And the way that we um, characterize load is the total arrival rate of the packets. And an arrival just refers to the transmission of a packet. And so when a packet is trans transmitted, we say that it has arrived in the shared channel. So that's where that terminology comes from. And the total arrival rate we characterize using the variable lambda. And lambda has the units of frames per second. And so the higher lambda is, the greater the load or the busier the shared channel. Now to make the analysis simpler, we also sometimes normalize arrival rate by the duration of a frame. And so normalized arrival rate is uh, something we denoted as G, and it's equal to the um, total arrival rate in frames per second multiplied by the duration of a frame. And so you can think of the units of nor as normalized arrival rate, well, it's basically unitless, but you can think of it, conceptually at least, as the number of frames <clears throat> that arrive per frame duration. Okay, so let's say, for example, we have a G equal to one. That means that on average, we have one frame arriving in our shared channel per frame length. So every TF seconds, we have one frame arrival. And so that's a fully utilized channel. So for every frame duration, we have exactly one frame showing up. Now, the key thing to remember here, though, is that this is an average quantity because we're working with a random process. This is average arrival rate. And this is also average arrival rate. So even if G is equal to one, that means on average, we have one frame showing up every TF seconds. Sometimes we might not have any, sometimes we might have two. It all just depends on how the, the random arrival rate happens to, to realize itself. But we're gonna use this normalized arrival rate, even though conceptually it's kind of, you, you do have to think about this a little bit just to kind of wrap your head around it, but it is actually gonna make our math a little bit easier as we sort of progress through this discussion. So it's fine for us to say that the transmission of frames in the shared channel is random, but we need to get a little bit more specific. So when we're dealing with a random variable, there is a distribution that typically we associate with random variables, maybe you're you know, for example, a random variable could be uniformly distributed or Gaussian distributed. And so for our frame transmission times, we assume that basically transmissions are equally likely to occur at any point in the channel. So a new transmission, or the transmission of a new frame or the retransmission of an existing frame after that random back off time sort of is kind of uniform enough that at any particular point um, the transmission of a frame is equally likely to occur. And so when this condition holds, we can say that the transmission of frames are Poisson distributed or they follow the Poisson distribution. And the Poisson distribution actually comes up a lot in network analysis. It's used very commonly to characterize the transmission of random 
the random transmission of packets in a dynamic access style of, of network. It can also be used to characterize the, you know, the, the flow of packets at sort of the higher layers in the internet across a, a, a mesh network, for example. And so if we assume packets are Poisson distributed, then we can use a bunch of probability tools that have been developed to work with the Poisson distribution. And the, the expression that we're going to find particularly useful here is the Poisson area of Poisson distribution theory allows us to write the probability of having K arrivals in T seconds. And you can probably already see why this is going to be useful for us, right? So ultimately, we're trying to find the probability of a collision. And we now, with this Poisson assumption, are able to write the probability of having a certain number of arrivals in a certain period of time. So basically, we're going to substitute in the duration of the vulnerable period for T we're going to set k to 0, right? Because our frame only gets through if there's no other arrivals during the vulnerable period. And that's essentially going to give us the probability of no collisions. And of course, then collisions is 1 minus the probability of no collisions. And so we'll just go through that math, though. So the actual probability expression is a function of the arrival rate. And it should be no surprise that, actually, in the interest of saving space, I'll move this. It should be no surprise that we see lambda show up in this equation because, of course, the busyness of the channel is going to affect the probability of having a certain number of arrivals in a particular time um, interval. So this is, this is our expression. Now we're going to take advantage of normalized um, this notion of normalized arrival rate. So since the total arrival rate is equal to the normalized arrival rate divided by the, um, the frame duration, I want to get a little bit more specific here and I want to determine the probability of k arrivals in 2tf seconds. And the reason why I'm substituting in 2tf here is because, of course, that's the duration of our vulnerable period. So we don't want any transmissions in that um, time. And I'm going to take this expression and substitute it in for lambda. So I'm going to do two things at once here. And we end up getting G over TF times 2TF to the K, K factorial, E to the minus G over oops, TF times 2TF. And of course, um, the TFs are going to cancel. And so we're going to get an expression that's actually independent of frame time. So this ends up being equal to 2 to the G to the K divided by K factorial times E to the minus 2G. And so we want... Um, so, so this expression is a, is a little bit more compact. We're no longer dependent on the specific length of our frame. And we're going to then take this in the next slide to incorporate back into our expression for overall throughput. Because 
Obviously, this is very related to the probability of collision. So what I want to do now is I want to write an expression for total throughput. Total shared channel throughput. And it's important to just pause here for a second and note the perspective that we're taking. So sometimes we take the perspective of the individual user. We want to figure out what is the experience of an individual user. But this is, we're taking a slightly different approach here. So we want to determine essentially the overall throughput for the shared channel. And this is perhaps a perspective that's a little bit more appropriate for a, a network service provider. So for example, if TELUS or the University of Calgary has made an investment in wireless network infrastructure that happens to use the Aloha protocol, we want to determine sort of the overall efficiency for that shared channel. And so that's what we're going to be, um, we're going to be calculating here. And so the total shared channel throughput I'm going to represent by the number S, and it's basically equal to um, the total traffic that we try to transmit over that shared channel multiplied by the, I'll write this as a probability, the probability that frames get through the shared channel. That's pretty vague, but we'll get more specific there in a second. So conceptually, it's basically how much total traffic are we dumping into this shared channel multiplied by the probability of a frame getting through, or basically the proportion of time that a frame gets through. So if we're dumping in a certain amount of traffic, but frames only get through the channel half the time, then the effective throughput of that channel is half of the traffic that we're you know, sort of feeding into the shared channel. And so the total traffic is just equal to our normalized arrival rate, G. So this is how many frames per frame interval we are dumping into, all the nodes are dumping into the shared channel at once. Um, and I should have maybe made that more clear when I introduced arrival rate. So arrival rate lambda in frames per second and our normalized arrival rate G, this is the total traffic on our shared channel. So it's not the traffic per user, it's the total traffic that all the nodes are dumping into our channel. And so the total traffic is equal to G, <clears throat> and the probability of frames getting through are basically is basically equal to the probability of no collisions in the vulnerable period. And this is equal to um, G times the probability of zero arrivals in two TF seconds. And we have an expression for this that we derived on the previous slide. So this is G, um, 2G to the zero, because K is equal to zero, divided by zero factorial E to the minus 2G, or our normalized throughput is G E to the minus 2G. And so the resulting expression is quite compact, and you can now maybe see why we uh, went to using this normalized throughput, because we get a, a very simple expression. And, you know, again, the reason why I, I like working through the math that kind of underpins network performance and protocol design is because quite often the mathematical expressions do a very good job of showing us the different processes at play when we try to figure out how throughput is going to behave in a particular sort of protocol. And so this first term, G, is the offered traffic. So this represents the amount of traffic we're dumping into the channel. 
and s will go up as g goes up, obviously, right? Because s and g are proportional. So this says that, you know, this first term g says that, you know, if we want a high throughput, let's just increase g. Let's make g as big as possible because as g goes up, s goes up as well. However, the second term, e to the minus 2g, represents the collision process. Whoops. Sure, process. And this is, you know, obviously g is the traffic. So the collision process uh, becomes more significant as we increase the amount of traffic in the channel. So as more frames are dumped into the channel, the chances of them colliding goes up. And so as G increases, this first term goes up, but the second term will go down. And again, similar to back when we were looking at ARQ, we now have two competing processes where um, one term goes up with increasing G and one term goes down with increasing G. And we're going to basically see there's an optimal value for traffic where, you know, we're dumping in enough traffic to make good use of the channel, but not so much traffic that we have a, an overwhelming number of collisions. So this is, uh, on, this, on this graph, we're basically plotting the equation S is equal to G times E to the minus 2G. On the y-axis, we have our effective throughput S, and on the x-axis, we have our total arrival rate, and I'm using a log scale on the x-axis. So this is, you know, G is equal to one, is right there. And there's a couple, I, I, I wanna sort of go through this kind of slowly because it, this, this plot really shows a, us a bunch of stuff. And so, Let's start out when G is very low. So G is equal to 0 0.01. So that means um, we have one frame showing up in our shared channel for every 100 frame intervals or 100 TF seconds. And here we see that at this point, our overall throughput is approximately equal to the throughput that we're offering in the channel. So we're dumping in point, a, a traffic load of 0 0.01 and we're getting out an effective throughput of about 0 0.01. So that basically means that every frame that we're dumping into the channel is successfully arriving at its destination. Why is that? It's because, again, S is equal to G times E to the minus 2G. This is the offered traffic, right? So at this point, it's G equal to 0 0.01. This is the collision process. But when G is so small, this is approximately equal to one. And so that means that basically every, you know, the, the chances of colliding are so small because the traffic on our shared channel is so light that um, the second term basically has no effect on our throughput. Now, if we start to increase our offered traffic, um, you know, at this point, G is equal to 0 0.02. And if we sort of go up and we go across, we can see that the, you know, the value of S is equal to 0 0.02. So, you know, we're the effective throughput of our channel is increasing approximately linearly with G. We don't really see a straight line because we're using a, a log X scale. Um, let's go to G is equal to 0 0.1. If we go up here and across. Now, all of a sudden, when we increase our offer traffic to 0.1, we're seeing that our value of S falls short of 0.1. So this is the throughput that we would get if there was no collisions or if we weren't accounting for collisions. But we can see already now with an, aver with an average traffic load of one frame for every 10 TF or uh, a normalized traffic load of 0.1, we're only getting a throughput of about 0.07. So this collision term now is starting to have an effect. 
It's not quite serious enough that we should stop increasing g, however. So as we increase g, we can still see that we're improving our overall throughput. Even though collisions are starting to get worse, increasing g is improving our first term enough that it is still um, worthwhile dumping more traffic into the channel. However, we do, as you would expect, achieve a maximum point. And at this point, we achieve kind of the balance between, you know, dumping in enough traffic into the shared channel that we're making good use of it, but not enough that the collisions are overwhelming us. However, once we move past this point, we can see that our throughput starts to go down. And what's happening here is the collision term is starting to get large enough that it is overwhelming the benefits that we're getting of offering more throughput to our, our channel. Um, and so what is our maximum? We max out at around 18% or 0.18. And that's pretty low. That's not a great throughput. And certainly if we were trying to design a wireless network to support internet traffic, you know, like a Wi-Fi style system, Aloha is not sufficient. Aloha definitely has its place. So there are a number of applications where we want a very lightweight, super simple protocol to use that um, for, for situations where we have very light traffic. So for example, when a cellular telephone first turns on and needs to uh, make the network aware of its presence, uh, it uses uh, just a quick sort of transmission on a special channel that just lets the network know that the, the phone is there and then the phone is then sort of transitioned to a, a, a different channel with a, a different Mac algorithm. But that initial sort of paging channel it's known as is often um, sort of controlled using an Aloha style protocol for a very lightweight, maybe smart home type application, maybe burglar alarm kind of application, you know, Aloha would be appropriate. But definitely if we want to get a decent amount of traffic on our shared channel and a decent amount of throughput, then we would want to make improvements. And so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna look, look at a variation of Aloha called slotted Aloha that's gonna do a little bit better. So slotted Aloha introduces a little bit of additional complexity to the Mac algorithm. Basically, slotted Aloha is exactly like regular Aloha, except that the nodes are restricted, they're, they're time synchronized and restricted to transmitting their packets only at certain time slots or only within certain time slots. And so to be more specific, I guess, if um, this is our vulnerable period um, diagram, all the nodes are time synchronized so that they are only allowed to transmit in intervals of the frame time. So if this is one of those intervals, if T naught is an allowed transmission time, then we're allowed to transmit at T naught plus TF, T naught plus two TF, T naught minus TF and so on. And so, what that means from a, a collision perspective, let's say this again is our colliding packet. So um, let's imagine maybe that the node, the interfering node wants to transmit at this point in time. Because of the synchronization introduced in slotted Aloha, the node is not allowed to transmit in the middle of a frame duration and instead has to wait and defer its transmission to the start of the next time slot. And so even though the node has data to send at this point, it has to wait until the start of the next time slot before it can transmit. And as a result of that, any packet that would have interfered with us sort of during our frame duration has to wait until the next time interval. And as a result, it doesn't interfere with us. And that's obviously good news. So we've, we've removed the, the possibility of collision for this particular scenario. Does that mean that there are no more collisions in slotted Aloha? Unfortunately, it doesn't because if you remember from our regular 
uh, aloha discussion. Any frame that starts to transmit before our desired frame, of course, would overlap with our packet. Now, in the slotted aloha case, any frame that is gener would have been generated in this interval is delayed to the start of the next time slot, but of course that time slot overlaps with our desired frame and, a, and the result is a collision. And so basically any transmission that occurs in the time slot before our transmission results in a collision. However, any interfering transmission that occurs during our time slot is deferred to the next time slot. And as a result, our vulnerable, our vulnerable period is half the duration that it used to be. So we've cut our vulnerable period in half. So the throughput derivation for slotted aloha is basically exactly the same as the derivation for regular aloha, except our vulnerable, vulnerable period is, two t or is TF rather than 2TF. And so the normalized throughput for slotted aloha is equal to the offered traffic times the probability of zero arrivals in TF seconds now rather than 2TF seconds. And, you know, I'm skipping a few steps here, obviously, but you can sort of backtrack and look at the regular Aloha derivation to fill in, fill in the gaps. This is equal to G, G raised to the exponent of zero, uh, zero factorial, e to the minus, whoops, no, there is no two there, e to the minus G. And so the only difference is there used to be a two there and there used to be a two there, but there isn't anymore. And so the overall normalized throughput for slotted aloha looks exactly like the expression for regular aloha, except there's no two in the exponent of the exponential term. And as a result, the collision uh, the influence of this second term, which of course is the collision, represents the collision process, takes longer to come into effect than it did for the regular aloha. And this is going to allow us to, off, to dump more traffic into the channel before the collisions start to have a, an impact on our overall shared channel throughput. And just to compare, this plot shows now both the throughput of regular aloha and slotted aloha. So this dotted line is g e to the minus 2g. And the solid line is g e to the minus g. And as we suggested in the previous slide, this collision term takes a little bit longer to come into effect, and that means we can basically um, increase our offered traffic in a slotted aloha channel before the collisions start to pull us back down. And so rather than achieving a maximum at about 18% throughput, we get all the way above to something a little bit above 35% throughput at an offered traffic level of as it turns out, g is equal to one. So we get our maximum throughput from slotted aloha when on average we are offering one, or we're generating one packet in our shared channel for every packet time slot. And again, that's on average, it's not, because it's random, it's not always gonna be one per time slot. And that still, however, results in a throughput, as I was saying, a little bit, you know, sort of around 36%. So even though we're offering one, we're, we're dumping in on average one packet per time slot, only 36% of those packets are actually getting delivered and the other ones are um, experiencing collisions. And so this, you know, again, there are certainly places for the, Aloha and in particularly in particular the slotted Aloha protocol as I said you do see them sometimes in like the paging channels of cellular telephone systems or very low throughput kind of 
instrumentation um, type applications. But for supporting internet traffic, a Wi-Fi type scenario, um, this isn't good enough. And so what we're going to look at in the next module is a family of multi or of Mac algorithms called Carrier Sense Multiple Access that really represent sort of the, the standard of how we, we do Mac algorithms for more high throughput applications.